Welcome to Shady Oaks Baptist Church. Whether you're worshiping with us at the church today or whether you're joining us online, we're just glad that you're worshiping with us. The Quarterly Family Church Dinner is this afternoon at 5 p.m. in the Commons area. And that dinner includes chili and all the fixings as well as dessert. Since there is work being done at this current time on the sanctuary ceiling, we will remain in the Commons area after the meal to review quarterly reports from both committees and staff. Saturday, October 12th, is the day for I Can Still Shine from 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. This is a day of ministry to women who've come out of abusive situations. And in order to minister to those women and their children, we need women to volunteer. And we still need several uh, volunteers. So if you want to volunteer or if you just want more information, you can contact Christy Fritz or Kathy Bates, or you can sign up at shadyoaks.org slash events. Saturday, November 16th, is the day for the Shady Oaks Homecoming Celebration. This will be a day of food, fellowship, games, and live music as we invite those who have attended Shady Oaks in the past to come back and see what the church is like today. There will also be a display of church memorabilia from past years. So go ahead and mark Saturday, November 16th on your calendar. Well, hey guys, welcome to worship this morning. Obviously, things are a little differently this morning as we're on YouTube and not live in the service, but uh, we're going to have worship together. We're going to take out an offering. We're going to preach. We're going to do all the things we normally do, but uh, want to involve you and get you incorporated from the very beginning of this. And so we're going to start out with some songs to sing together and have some worship. I encourage you to participate, stand if you'd like, but definitely participate in singing together. But this is a, a very awesome song to me because it talks about the grace that we have in Christ Jesus and the grace that we have because he sent his son to live a sinless and perfect life and to die on the cross for our sins and that we can spend eternity with him. So it's called Your Grace is Enough. Great is your faithfulness, O God. You wrestle with the sinner's heart. You lead us by still waters into mercy. And nothing can keep us apart. So remember your people. Remember your children, remember your promise, O oh God. Your grace is enough, your grace is enough, your grace is enough for me. is your love and justice God you use the weak to lead the strong you lead us in the song of your salvation and all your people sing along Remember your people, remember your promise, you're in your children, remember your promise, oh God, your grace is enough, your grace is enough, your grace is enough for me. God, I sing that your grace is enough. Your grace is enough. Your grace is enough for me. So remember, so remember your people. Remember your children. Remember your promise. 
começo Your grace is enough Your grace is enough Your grace is enough for me God, I sing that your grace is enough I'm covered in your love. Your grace is enough for me. How I long to breathe the air of heaven where pain is gone and mercy fills the streets to look upon the one who bled to save me and walk with him for all eternity there will be a day when all will bow before him there will be a day when death will be no more standing face to face with he who died and rose again holy holy is the lord and every prayer i prayed in desperation the songs of faith we sang through doubt and fear and in the end we'll see that it was worth it when he returns to wipe away our tears there will be a day when all will bow before him there will be a day when death will be no more standing face to face with he who died and rose again holy holy is the lord and on that day we join the resurrection and stand beside the heroes of the faith and with one voice a thousand generations sing worthy is the lamb who was slain So let it be today, we shout the hymn of heaven, with angels and the saints, we raise a mighty roar, glory to our God, who gave us life beyond the grave, holy, holy is the Lord, so let it be today, we shout the with angels and the saints we raise a mighty roar glory to our god who gave us life beyond the grave holy holy is the lord holy holy is the lord holy holy
All right, guys, obviously this is a change of, of scenery for us as a Sunday morning gathering, but uh, I'm having a pretty strong COVID flashback here. I'm in a room by myself uh, with a camera and uh, preaching to you guys. Uh, but uh, we're together as a church, and so that's a really good part of that. Guys, we're uh, in the book of Acts, chapter 16 today. Uh, we're going to be uh, taking a look at three very different people who are converted in three uh, different ways. And uh, we're taking a look at the reach of the gospel and the power of the gospel to reach people. Uh, guys, one of the, my favorite things about being a Christian and talking to people, being a pastor and talking to people, uh, is hearing people's salvation stories, hearing how they uh, came to faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And, and it's amazing to see the diversity that's in those stories. Uh, we all didn't go to the same thing. We all didn't do the same thing. Yes, the same Savior brought us there, but there are some crossover in being at church or being at a camp or a retreat or, or at home with your parents. Uh, but, but there's all different scenarios in how we come, and that's the beauty of the gospel is that it's not contained to one methodology or one way of doing thing, uh, I think, or one type of person. I think it's very interesting for us to realize that we have a, a gospel that is able to reach anyone and no one's beyond the reach of the gospel. And I think it's encouraging for us to realize that we need to open up our eyes to see the people around us as people that God wants to, us to reach for the gospel uh, and with the gospel. And I think that we need to think through uh, a different lens. Uh, guys, the, the gospel will reach anybody, no matter how stubborn or how difficult they might be. Uh, Charles Spurgeon tells a story of a man who uh, went to chapel to listen to the singing. Wasn't a big fan of the preaching. Sorry if that's you here today, but I hope that's not you. And so when the pastor began to, to preach, he would put his fingers in his ears. And while he's doing that, an insect landed on his face, and so he had to take one finger out to wipe away the insect. And just as he did that, the, the pastor said, he that has ears to hear, let him hear. And he took his other finger out and he listened to the rest of the story and God met him in that moment and he gave his life to Jesus Christ. A fly landing on his face opened up an opportunity for him to hear the gospel and to respond to the gospel. Guys, we have such a great opportunity to think through some things here. Uh, guys, I would imagine that if you were to go around the room today and you were to, to dis you discover the great links that the Lord went to to draw us to Himself, to bring us to the point of salvation. I think it's interesting that we all had different things that pulled us. We all have different things that drew us. We all think, but we have one Savior. Today's passage is a great illustration of the power of the reach of the gospel. We have three different people coming, from, coming to faith in Christ in three very different ways. As we listen to these verses today, I don't want you just to zone out and go through the story of listening things. The words are going to be on the screen. You can follow along with that. But I want to encourage you to think about how grateful you are for how the Lord brought you to Himself. That's something we have to have a, an excitement about because if we're not excited about our own salvation, how would we tell anybody else? Why would we tell anybody else? And such an encouraging thing for us to look at. And so we're going to begin in Acts chapter 16, starting in verse 11 this morning. We pick up the story here and it says, So setting sail for Troas, we made a different voyage, a direct voyage to Samothrace. And the following day to Neapolis. And from there to Philippi, which is the leading city of the district of Macedonia. And a Roman colony at that. Uh, we remained in this city for some days. Actually, the, the record is they stayed for several weeks. But... Obviously, because we're picking up the story in verse 11, there's some stuff that happens prior to this. And so Paul is trying to make roads into a certain part of Asia, and he's being forbidden to speak by God. And so he has a dream of a man waving him in the direction. And this is a passage called the, the, the Macedonian call, where he receives a call to go to Macedonia. And so we pick up the story here, and that's where it begins here. And we know that the Lord was with him because generally this trip would take anywhere from three to five or more days. But we see here recorded in our passage that it took two, one day to Samothrace and then one day to Neapolis and then the walk inward to, in, in, inland to uh, Philippi. And so the Lord was obviously with him, blowing wind at their back, I guess you could say. But when he gets to Philippi, one of the things about the city was a Roman colony. It's a well-established Roman colony. has great history in the Roman context of things. And it was actually called Little Rome. And so it's a place that Rome has a very strong influence in. But we also will see that there's also some things that's missing from there. Let's pick up the story. 
after this, but there's three conversions that we're going to talk about today, three very different people. We're going to talk about a, a, a lady named Lydia, a slave girl, and a jailer. Three different people, three different contexts, but yet one amazing story of them coming to faith and trust in Jesus Christ and how they put their faith and trust in the one Savior. They are different ethnically, they're different economically, spiritually, and their conversion stories are very different as well. They didn't get saved all the same way. They didn't come to faith in Christ the same way. So first, let's talk about Lydia. Picking up the story in verse 13, it says, On the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate to the riverside, where we supposed there was a place of prayer. And we sat down and spoke to the women who had come together. One who heard us was a woman named Lydia. She was from the city of Theatira, a seller of purple, who was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what Paul was saying. So normally when Paul would go to a town, he would go in and he would go to the synagogue first. But we see that he didn't go there. He went outside the gate. And outside the gate were where these women were gathering. And they assumed there was a place to pray, but these women had gathered, so they sat down there. They didn't just say, well, we couldn't find a place to pray. Let's just go on and try our day. No, they plugged in in a place there because there was an opportunity in front of them. Lydia was a seller of purple, Scripture tells us, and this would tell, her that, tell us that she's a very wealthy person. She had lots of uh, influence with the color purple and selling to royalty and things like that. And so she had uh, great means to uh, do things with her wealth, which, why is she outside the gate? Why is she not training? There's all kinds of questions here, but she had an appointment that God set up for. It also says that she was a worshiper, but not a Christian. She was a worshiper of God. She knew of God, but she didn't know God. If you remember the story a few weeks ago, we have Cornelius who has a dream about reaching out to Peter and Peter shows up and reveals to him who this God is that he knows of and he puts his faith and trust in Jesus Christ and we see something similar with that in there. But we also see that God is the one who opened up her heart to hear and to respond to the gospel. It wasn't something that she did. It wasn't how she corrected herself and got herself all cleaned up and showed her privilege. And like She had her heart opened by God. She was saved by God's grace. She wasn't saved by anything she had done. She really wasn't even saved by anything that Paul said, per se, because the power of God works. I also want to think about the reality is, is that they're now in Europe. They're not in Asia anymore, and they're in Europe. And so it's very likely that Lydia was probably the first person ever converted to Christianity in all of Europe. That's an amazing thing to think about. Do you think about the reality is that I have European heritage and some of you might have European heritage that there's a possibility that if there was Christianity in your family, Lydia had a, had, is part of our background. I think it's neat to see how the gospel all, all connected there. But we also see that she didn't just like stay outside the gate. She opened up her house for more, to want to hear more, but also to, 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 to minister to Paul and Silas. We see in verse 15, and after she was baptized and her household as well, she urged us saying, if you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. And she prevailed upon us. Her conversion sparked her entire household to be saved. Think about the influence people can have that when they pray to receive Christ, they tell other people and how that can respond and the excitement and the joy they can have in those moments. And so that the gospel is not just for one person one-on-one. -on -one. It could be for a whole family. It could be for a whole household that gets saved. We also see that she extended hospitality to Paul and Silas. She opened up her home. Now, she was wealthy and she probably had a nice home, but she was opening her home being hospitable to, her, to them, opening her home to serve them and to serve the church by serving them. And again, that's not for you to come invite me to your house and serve the church that way, but we can serve the Lord by opening up our house. Well, Jay, my house is messy. Well, you can fix that, but also I want to encourage you, hospitality is about serving people, not about impressing people. And hospitality is about responding to the, the needs that they have and how we can serve them. So that's the story of Lydia. Next, we move on to a slave girl that we see. And the slave girl story picks up in verse 16. As we were going to the place of prayer, and we were, met, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners much gain by fortune-telling. She followed Paul 
and us, crying out, These are men, these men are servants of the Most High, who proclaim to you the way of salvation. And this kept going for a while. And she kept doing this for many days. And Paul, having become greatly annoyed, turned and said to the Spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out of her that very hour. Guys, this spirit of divination that she had uh, really means that, uh, when you interpret it in the language there, that she had a spirit of the python. A spirit, of a, a spirit python would be uh, obviously a demonic spirit inside of her, and so that when she would tell the future, she was actually, this python was speaking through her. I'm not trying to freak you out, I'm just going by what the text says and, and what we can learn through that. But we know that she was demon-possessed, and she was not of a spirit of the Lord. And so this spirit and the spirit inside of Paul and Silas were definitely aware of each other. And Paul got annoyed of hearing her, but also probably having compassion for her, turns to her and says, in the name of Jesus Christ, be freed. Leave, leave this girl. Leave her alone. And you've got to just think in the moment that that happens, this, this spirit leaves her and she's open to hearing what they have to say. She's now in her right mind. We see in several instances where a demon possession of somebody in Scripture is removed from them, their mind returns to them. And we see that she becomes a follower of Jesus Christ through this process. And, and, and the thing to catch here, guys, that's a pretty powerful story. But exorcism takes place on the side of the road here. But, but here's the deal. Uh, the same power that freed the young girls, also the same power that opened up the heart of Lydia to hear the gospel. So we've talked about Lydia. We've talked about a slave girl. Let's next talk about the jailer. So in freeing this girl of the spirit... Uh, the demonic spirit that was in her, she, uh, she had owners who made money off of her ability to tell the future. And it was a very popular thing for people to hear the future. We would like to hear the future, all those different things. Uh, none of us would sit there and say, I don't want to know what the future says. I would love to know what the future says. But here's this person that's able to do that, and people would pay great money for this. Well, she can't do that anymore because the spirit has left her, and guess what? These guys are mad. These guys are mad. They want their money. They want to be able to, to, to get their, their, their money back. And so they make up a story. And they make up a story and they falsely accuse Paul and Silas about stirring up the society. And they get beaten and they get thrown in, in prison. And uh, they're in prison and the power of God shows up in a very different but yet equally powerful way. I mean, opening the heart of Lydia, having an exorcism of the demon, leaving this young girl. Still, God shows up in a, in a more powerful way still, but also very differently. Let's pick up the story in verse 25. After midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly, there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's bounds were unfastened. So an earthquake takes place. Obviously, God is doing this. The jailer who happens to be there, he's asleep at, the, at, at this time. It's at midnight, so it's a good time to be asleep, I guess. And so he's asleep and this earthquake wakes him up and he looks around and he sees the doors open. And he begins to realize, I'm going to get killed by Romans and really, by, by my authorities in a really bad way. I'm going to kill myself before that happens. And so we pick up the story in verse 28. It says, But Paul cried out with a loud voice, Do not harm yourself, for we are all here. And I think it's a wonderful thing to, to just imagine this, this calm that comes about him because you have to think he was about to kill himself and Paul cries out to him and says, Don't harm yourself. And so it, Paul saves him physically. He was about to kill himself, and he doesn't. And then he goes in to check on the situation, and he sees Paul and Silas, and the jailer is moved spiritually. So saved physically, moved spiritually, and he asks a most important question, a very important question, and that is this found in verse 30. It says, When he had brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said to him, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. And then verse 32 says, And they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. So, 
The jailer takes them out of prison. He takes them to his house. Not only does he get saved, but his, the household gets saved. Again, the influence that God is having on one person getting saved, the impact it has on the people around them is very something, something we have to pay attention to. We see that Paul points the jailer, points the jailer to the only name that saves, and that name is Jesus Christ. Think about that for a second. He doesn't sit there and say, do this and skip to this, clean yourself up, do all these things. He doesn't say anything. He says, call on the name of the Lord and you will be saved. Paul later says, if we confess with our mouth, call on the Lord and believe in our hearts that God raised him from the dead, we are saved. We know that a call out to the Lord is the beginning of our repentance, the beginning of our salvation moment. And Paul points him to Jesus. He points the whole family to Jesus. And they're all baptized. Could you imagine one day you don't even know or care much about God and the next day your whole family's being baptized because uh, something amazing happened and God used a man who was in your prison to impact you and now you're being baptized with your whole family. What a beautiful picture. What a beautiful picture for us to see. What, a, what an amazing way for us to look at this and not sit there and be sidetracked by this the story itself but just realize that God in His amazingness had three appointments, three appointments for Paul and Silas. There was no synagogue. They didn't normally gather in the synagogue. They would only go to the synagogue. They're outside the gate. They happen to run into a lady. They begin to open up their mouth, and God takes it from there. They are followed by a girl, and instead of just having followed by her and ignoring her and pretending she's going to go away, they got annoyed. I think it's okay to be spiritually annoyed by somebody one time, uh, sometimes, but here's the thing. Uh, he's annoyed, calls the spirit out of it. She's saved. They get thrown in jail because of the situation. Now, here's another opportunity for God to use His power to save somebody. Guys, what an amazing thing for us to look at. So let's apply this. Let's take a look at this from a helicopter view real quick. Three people. Okay? These three people. <clears throat> Lydia, she was a wealthy Asian woman. She wasn't from Greece She was or Philippi. She was, uh, she was an Asian woman. Okay, She knew of God, she didn't know God, and she was saved in a public place. Out on the side of the street, Paul shares, she responds. The slave girl, she was poor, she was a slave. She was from the area, she was Greek, but she was tormented by an evil spirit that gave her the power to tell the future. Now, she may have liked it, and she may, the Spirit inside her may have been mocking Paul and Silas, but, but in doing so, the encounter with a powerful and more powerful God in the name of Jesus Christ, that Spirit was removed from her, and she had a dramatic exorcism on the side of the road. The jailer, he's a blue-collar worker. He's a soldier, just doing his job, sleeping. <laughs> He didn't really have uh, one way or the other. Romans didn't care. They had many gods. And so the, the God of the Bible was not anybody he would have been concerned about. And yet he was saved by a powerful miracle. An earthquake happens. Nobody escapes. It opens up his heart to see and to respond to God. And so the, the, the words and the example of Paul and Silas save him and his whole family. So I guess the question is, all three of these people were saved in the power of Jesus Christ. All of them were saved in the power of Jesus Christ. They didn't do anything to get saved. Jesus Christ's power brought them to the point of salvation. And so I have a question for you this morning. Have you been saved by the power of Jesus Christ? Have you been brought to Jesus Christ through His calling you? Have you been drawn to Him? Have you, do you have the power of Jesus Christ living in you now because the same power that's in, in, in doing these amazing miracles is the same power that comes inside of us to allow us to accomplish great things? Why? Because God is all-powerful. He's all-knowing. He's all-great. And He's a great God for us to realize. And so I want to encourage you this morning. Have you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ? Have you had that moment like Lydia, like the slave girl, like the jailer, where you were lost and then you were found? You were dead in your sins, and you became alive in Jesus Christ. If you've never had that point, then you need to have that point today. You need to have that point today because there's no point in trying to sit there and clean yourself up and do the right things. Lydia had wealth. She couldn't buy salvation. The little girl had a demon spirit, a spirit inside of her, and she couldn't save herself. 
The jailer was in charge of a whole jail. He was doing his job. He was a blue-collar guy doing his thing. But he couldn't save himself. So we can't save ourselves, and we need the power of God to save us. The power of God sent Jesus Christ to die for you and for me. And if we put our faith and trust in Him, if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord, He's the boss, He's the one, He's in control, and we believe in our heart that God raised Him from the dead, we will be saved. And so these conversion stories are are an opener for us today to say, we we have to put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ. We have to realize that He's the one that saves me. He's the one that does it. We give up control of our efforts and our works, and we say, God, I surrender to you. God, I can't save myself. Will you please save me? Guys, on the screen is a number you can text the word, text the word respond to. If you're uh, wanting to this morning, do that, and we will take that form, and we will follow up with you as soon as possible, and we will get back with you to, to, to help you understand more about that. If you're here today and you're, you're sitting in a life group room or you're somewhere in the church, you're like, you know, I'm hearing this and there's something different about it today. I, gotta, I need to respond to this. I need, I need to give my life to Jesus Christ. I'd encourage you just to excuse yourself and, and come find us. We'll be in the hallway here uh, you to come find us. We'll be glad to talk to you and, and help you understand and explain to you more about this Jesus Christ who has the power to save you. But if you're here today and you've already done that, well... There are a couple things we can learn from these conversion stories, things that we can take from here and apply to our lives because that's really what the purpose of Scripture is, not just to hear it, but to apply it. The first thing is, is that there's no recorded story or thing that we see Paul saying here. It just says that he says and he spoke Jesus. So there's no record of Paul using a special method or a program. He shared and showed Jesus and God did all the work. Guys, this is a great encouragement for us as we try to pray for God to use us to be bold around us. We don't have to say fancy words. We don't have to come up with something and be all eloquent. All we have to do is rely upon the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit does all the work anyways. You could say the most amazing gospel presentation and nobody could reply to it. You could say the most awful one and thousands of people come to you. Why? Because it's the power of God, not the power of your words. That's very important for us to realize. The second thing that we can learn from this is that in all these encounters, Paul's relied on the power of Jesus to take his words, his words and give them power. He didn't take them and, and, and you know, try to be powerful in what he said. He just spoke. And guys, I want to encourage you just to speak. Open up your mouth and begin talking and allow God to take it over from there. The third thing, and then all three of these, drastic, uh, these three drastically impacted the people in their lives. They did not keep their salvation a secret. Guys, we who know that we're going to heaven, we who have been saved by the power of Jesus Christ cannot be people who are quiet about it. We need to be people who get there and begin the process of saying, you know what, it's time for me to get off my blessed assurance and go and tell people about this salvation that I know to be true. And so we need to begin praying about opportunities. And and, and, and lastly, a question here, guys, what do you need to do today to be ready to be used by God wherever He places you. Guys, there's not a mistake that happens. There's, you, don't, you don't do anything in your life that God doesn't go, oops, that was a mistake. Everything He does, He has an opportunity to send us places. Are we willing to look at the people around us and respond in Christian love to them? Maybe just to serve them. Maybe to love them. Maybe to open up our mouths. Guys, there's all kinds of ways we can share the gospel with people. Guys, conversations. I want to encourage you guys, be ready to be used by the Lord. Get ourselves ready to be used by the Lord because it's the power of Jesus Christ that saves people, not us, but it's the power in us that we need to go and be bold in doing so. Guys, I want to close out our service praying together. We've been doing this for the last several weeks and and I just got to tell you, um, prayer works and uh, uh, we've been praying for God to, to, uh, to have a revival in amongst us. And we need that to happen. We need God to revive us, a call to begin. God, would you begin with me in a revival? Would you open up my heart and my mind so that I can help others catch on fire and we can all become on fire and then we could burn <laughs> through this city for the Lord? What a great thing we could call on the Pond Lord to do, but it has to begin somewhere. We have to get our eyes open. We have to despise sin. We have to call upon the name of Jesus to live amongst us. And so that's a prayer for us. 
The second thing fits with our message today, and that is we need to pray for boldness to go share the gospel. Guys, remember, it's not about what you say, it's that you say. Because again, we don't save people, God saves people. God is drawing people to Himself. And guys, we could go out there and open up our mouths and say the word Jesus one time, and somebody's going to be so ready to hear it that we'll be dumbfounded how we didn't say anything, but yet God drew Him to Himself. And so let's just be bold witnesses for Him and be more bold than we are today. And lastly, guys, we've been praying about our financial situation. Uh, guys, we've been talking about this, and there's all kinds of stuff. And I just got to tell you, uh, God is awesome. He answers our prayers, and He hears us. And so, guys, we've been praying about our, our, our insurance not being renewed at the end of this month and, and the fears of all that. And everything that Richard and I have been hearing is that we're expected to pay three or four times what we're currently paying for our property insurance. Guys, that's a number that we would be very, very difficult to handle. And that six, seven, eight thousand dollars a month added to our budget would be very difficult for us to do. But I just want to tell you something, guys. This week, we got a quote from an insurance company that is less than we are currently paying for our property insurance. I want to make sure you heard that. It's less than we are currently paying for our property insurance. Why? Because I believe we were desperate and we called on God and He said, Let me show you what I can do. Guys, that's the God that we call upon. That's the God who can rescue us. That's the God who has the power to save. That's the God that we want to pray to right now. So let's do that. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for the God who hears our prayers. I thank you that you are a God that goes before us and does great and wonderful things that we know not of. But Father, we come to you today needing you to revive our hearts. Lord, we need a revival, a personal revival inside of us that awakens us and that we join with other believers here at Shady Oaks Baptist Church to, to ignite something that's bigger than us because, God, you are bigger than us, and your call upon us is bigger than we can do by ourselves. So, Lord, I pray that you would begin with me. Revive me and let me be a spark to other people's personal revival. Lord, may we encourage each other, may we walk with each other, may we be challenged in each other to, to grow in you and to become on fire for you. Father, I pray for us to be like these situations today, not, not realizing how you're going to do it, but God, that you're going to draw people to yourself, that you're going to save people. And so, Father, I pray that you would do abundantly more than we can think or ask when it comes to opening up our mouths and telling people about Jesus. God, we need boldness. We need boldness to just pause and to be able to stop in the grocery store and have conversations with people and interact with people. God, I pray that we would, we would have interactions with people. So our family, we had Lydia and the jailer today who, because of their salvation, their families were impacted. And so, God, I pray that you would begin to have us to have our influence on our families. Why? Because we can't stop talking about Jesus and the power of Jesus in our lives and the truth that's true reality in Him. God, I want to just praise you for the answered prayer this week. With, we, we've cried out to you on our finances and specifically in this insurance endeavor. God, what an amazing blessing to realize that we're not going to pay more and much more. God, we're going to pay less because, God, you're a God that just said, guys, let me, let me work. Let me show you what I want to do. And so, God, I pray that each of us hearing today and responding to this prayer time, God, would not just sit there and go through the motions of prayer, but realize we are praying to a God who can do abundantly more than we can think or ask. God, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't say one idea about, God, will you pay less than we're paying now? I just didn't want to pay a lot more. But, God, in my prayer, you blew me away, and you blew us away by giving us a policy that's less than we're currently paying. God, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for a God that hears our prayers. God, you hear our prayers about our finances as a church. May we be, have the wisdom that we don't currently have to make decisions and to do the things necessary to, to get our church in a place that we can serve you and honor you and not be worried about the finances, God. But Lord, I pray for anybody who is hearing this that's not giving Lord, I pray that you would just open up their heart to realize, God, that you can be tested and tried and proven true, that you will take care of us when we give to you. God, everything I have, everything we have is yours anyways, God. We're just being managers of it. And I pray that you would do abundantly more with that than we could think or ask. So, God, again, I thank you for this spirit of desperation that we as a church have, Lord. Our church is being fixed up. Our church is, uh, has been damaged by a storm. Uh, our insurance is being dropped. All these things, worry, 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 worry. But God, you said, God, I got you. Shady Oaks Baptist Church, I got you. And I just want us to be thankful of that today and praising the God that's going to give us a spirit of reigniting a fire inside of us or of, of revival in our hearts. 
You're a God who's going to call us to be bold and to bring people across our pathway where we can tell them about the power of Jesus, God. And we know that you're going to show up in our finances in ways that we know not of because you already have. And we thank you and we bless you for that. And so, God, I pray that you would take this message today and this prayer time and the power that we have inside of us and the, and the power that prayer has in calling upon the God who can do all things. Lord, just thank you. Thank you for the calling. Thank you for the desire. Thank you for the passion to, to, to realize, God, that you're the only one that can answer the questions. You're the only one that can come through. You're the only God that can fix it. And so we thank you. So, Lord, we love you. We praise you. We thank you. And we bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. Guys, thanks. That's the end of our service today. I hope that uh, you're ready to transition and talk further about Acts chapter 16 in your life groups. Uh, but uh, uh, we got a couple more weeks of this. Looking forward to uh, uh, seeing what God does through the me this medium. But also, guys, remember, we serve a great God. He's good all the time, and He's always good. And we need to realize that and live our lives accordingly. Love you guys. Have a great week.